Yeah. Very good evening to all the dignitaries and uh, all the participants of uh, this particular faculty development program. I, Dr. Kalicharan Modak, on behalf of entire IPS Academy, IBMR Indore, I welcome you all to this two-week faculty development program sponsored by Atal and uh, would like to give the brief what we have done in last two days. In the first day of this particular FDP, ma'am, uh, we have covered the this discussion on human resource management and day two of this particular faculty development program. We have gone through the framework for analyzing the case. So this is the day three of this particular faculty development program, which is conducted on the hybrid mode and uh, would like to introduce ma'am yeah dr smriti verma ma'am is the vice president academia mastersoft erp solutions she is a passionate teacher an avid researcher and a practitioner she is having over two decade of teaching experience in institute like IMT, Nagpur, Symbiosis University of Applied Sciences, Hindustan University, Chennai, IIMR, associated with several institutes as adjunct faculty. He has delivered guest lecture at FLV, Uralberg University of Applied Sciences, Austria, and Konstanz University of Applied Sciences, Germany. She has more than 70 national and international research publications, including cases published in Emerald Case Studies in Emerging Market, Case Center, and from part of textbook. She is a reviewer of Emerald Publishing United Kingdom, Inter Science Publisher, and Editorial Board Member with Case and Publication. She has conducted MDPs and FDPs in area of marketing, research writing, case study writing, analysis, and Application. So, on behalf of IBMR IPS Academy, I just welcome you, ma'am, to this two week faculty development program. So, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, and without wasting much time, would like to hand over this virtual dais to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, sir. <clears throat> Uh, I hope my screen is visible. Yes, ma'am. Right. Okay. Um, so without much ado, I will take over by talking you, to you today about case writing. So I understand that you've already done um, some work on case analysis. So today I'll take it forward and help you understand uh, the nitty gritties of case writing. Um, Please don't uh, hesitate in interrupting me in between in case if you have any questions, uh, I'll be more than happy to answer them. And uh, I, I just hope that the session is as interactive as possible. Um, so the agenda that I will be uh, you know, conducting will be, uh, there are two sessions that I've been told to conduct. So I'll be talking about case cases, uh, case writing, essentials of cases and sources of case information. Um, after that, we'll have a brief break, uh, and then I will come to more rudiments of case writing, essentials of case structure. I will also be telling you how to perform or write a teaching note. And if time permits, we will also do a discussion on publications. Um, we will also have an open session uh, between 9 and 9.30, and uh, I'll be happy to address any queries that you have. So um, I'm sure uh, you know you must have gone through this several times, but just just because um, no, I want to take it up my way. So I thought I must discuss with you on why uh, you know cases came into being. Now, if you actually look at the history of case writing, uh, case studies, basically, uh, this whole concept started somewhere around in 1920s. Um, so that's the time when actually case studies became very popular. And of course, today when we look at it. Case studies are not just used for academic purposes, but case studies are something that uh, essentially forms a part of corporates also. For example, the current corporate that I work for, I do essentially write um, effective case studies for them, wherein we try and demonstrate our best practices or we demonstrate our um, test cases 
So this is another reason why case studies have become extremely important and essential. And uh, both academicians and people from the corporate can utilize uh, this session um, in order to be able to articulate uh, case studies. Yes, of course, my session is going to be more focused towards academicians because I've been told that most of the people who are participating are from the academic uh, fraternity. And I would es essentially like to um, yeah, you know, focus my presentations towards uh, uh, this uh, you know, um, August gathering. Uh, so uh, a case study basically is something which is essential for students because um, it is a simulation of real situations. Um, more so, when we talk about a situation, a situation is formulated by the people who are forming a part of the situation. So a case study basically represents the reality. It tells you who were the participants, what role did the participants play in a particular situation, and then probably, you know, uh, you take it forward into different formats, which I'll be talking about later. But a case study largely will talk about a situation and the participants of that situation. Uh, the case studies could be um, revolving around single individuals or sometimes organizations, and sometimes there are case studies um, which are addressing a complete nation or a complete world. Uh, so when um, you know I uh, do sessions of international marketing uh, with my students at uh, University of Vorarlberg or uh, Constance University, there I essentially use case studies which are related to world, which are related to global um, uh, parameters, or sometimes you know specific to a particular country. For example. Now, if we look at what is the most prospective market uh, market currently from the marketing perspective, so I talk more about marketing because that's my area of specialization. Um, and uh, so we look at sub-Saharan African countries to be the most prospective market. They're the frontier countries. So uh, we give them case studies or we discuss case studies on these specific countries of sub-Saharan African region. Um, Case studies will be a reflection of the real world. So definitely, um, you must completely understand the fact that case studies will reflect reality. It is not something that you can create out of your own imagination. You cannot talk about um, misconceptions. There is a reality that has to be going in. And of course, when we talk about reality, reality is complex. And that's the reason why writing case studies is a complex activity because you have to kind of understand what kind of a direction do you want to give to the case study. Um, for students, uh, uh, definitely the objective of writing case studies or, um, you know, objective of basically a case study is retrieving knowledge. Uh, this also gets me to talk about this, that every case study should have certain piece of knowledge that you can derive of the case study. Uh, the case study should be able to hone the analytical techniques or um, the hon analytical skills of the students and they should be able to understand the good habits of analysis. So when I mean a good habit of analysis, I mean to tell you this, that analysis is a process. Analysis is not an achievement. Analysis is the path that you pass. And the good habits of analysis will help students understand, um, or when you solve a case study um, with the students uh, and help them analyze it, you should be able to Take them through the process of what is the right step of analysis. There are so many times that decisions, you know, um, today when we look around us, uh, you look at the newspapers and every other company is having certain goof ups. Why does it happen? Because you are trying to make hasty decisions. You are making decisions which have not taken the complete path of analysis. So when the students are in the shoes of the managers, when they get uh, certain portfolios to take care of, um, we should be able to, you know, kind of reiterate the fact to them that, um, you know, uh, you cannot just make decisions like this. There is a process of analysis that you have to pass through. And this is where students have to be um, taught or, um, you know, kind of, uh, this is a habit that the students need to inculcate uh, in terms of doing an analysis. Uh, 
every manager has a constitution of his or her own. So there are certain personality types of a manager. Case studies also help you understand the manager's perspective. And that's one of the reasons why when you write, uh, write case studies, you could probably also be, um, you know, talking about uh, things like the personality or the background of the manager, which helps students understand that why he or she has such kind of a perspective. And of course, uh, case studies are a personal development for both faculties as well as the students. Students learn the uh, skill of uh, um, decision making and uh, faculties learn the skill of being able to enhance their publication skills. Uh, students are also able to derive insights. So when we are in classes, uh, practically it is not possible to teach everything as theory. Theory sometimes seems to be boring also. Uh, but then when you want to create excitement, when you want to create, uh, so in marketing, we keep talking about customer involvement. And in classrooms, we talk about student involvement. Today, when we look at, uh, um, you know, the World Bank talking about uh, additions to education sector that should happen. So one of the most important thing that they talk about is student involvement. And case studies play a very important role there because it helps the students derive the concepts themselves. It helps the students come to conclusions, helps them to understand if I go this way, where will I reach? If I go the other way, which way will I reach? And, you know, probably there may not be anything that's right or wrong, but the destinations may change. So which way are you going? Um, and deriving the theory sometimes plays a very important role in the development of the students. Uh, it also helps them understand that okay, this is a real problem, this is a corporate, and this is the solution to real problems. Now, when I talk about this real problem and corporate context, what do I mean to say? Um, whenever we are actually running our own businesses or we are into important portfolios in a business, we completely understand this fact that everything in the environment is not known to us, one. Two, things are complex. So it may not be an HR a case study, it may not be a marketing case study, it may not be a finance case study, it may be something which has everything put together. So there's an accounting guy who's having trouble with the HR guy and the HR guy sees that uh, there's this marketing um, guy who's not performing well and he's not able to capture the market. Revenues are not coming in because revenues are not coming in. This accountant is not able to do his job perfectly and so on and so forth. There's a lot of nitty, -nitty gritties uh, which are inbuilt in the situation. So one, uh, environmental analysis is not clear. Two, the problems may involve multiple functional areas. Three, you may be required to make decisions in a particular time frame. So we don't have all the time in the world to make decisions when we are in business. We definitely have to make hasty decisions. So what you're trying to actually do is you're trying to teach the students how to segregate these issues and then come to a resolution in the time frame given. So when I tell you this, that you have to teach the students uh, the good habits of analysis, I'm also suggesting to you, even if you have a short time, even if the time span is limited, yet you can pass through all these stages. You may be doing it at a faster pace, but you have to pass these stages. You have to understand that today we are living in a very, very, you know, kind of uh, unique and ambiguous environment where, Things are changing at a very, very fast pace. Uh, students should uh, also be able to receive an opportunity to apply everything that they are learning in their classes to action. Uh, so I have been working for Applied Sciences University for quite some time now. And uh, of course, the foreign universities that I visit are also Applied Sciences University. And one of the most significant difference between a regular academic university and an Applied Sciences University is this, that Applied Sciences Universities emphasize on application of concepts. So there's more of time that's given to skill building, right? So um, case studies, definitely something that are integral part of applications because they are situations which help you understand the challenges, which put a pressure on you. Um, you know, you are able to um, figure out that in complex situations, how will I react? You don't know. So when the student actually reach, reaches a corporate, 
uh, they sometimes find it extremely difficult and intriguing to be able to handle pressure situations. So these case studies are like pressures. They are like you know, situations where you are, you know, kind of telling the student. So when you start a case analysis, I'm sure you would have learned this. Um, there are so many times when you choose a case study, you choose a case study on the basis of decisions, right? And then the first thing that you pressurize your class is that you, you know, uh, the first question is you have to make the decision first and then tell us why did you reach this decision? So when you're doing that, you're applying kind of a pressure and that's the place where the students are applying their op whatever they've read. So this is a very, very effective way of experiential learning. Uh, students should be able to create knowledge, as I said, uh, they should be able to apply facts to cases. And that's the reason when you write cases, I always recommend write cases with data, write cases with information that can be crunched, write uh, cases with uh, situations which are not straight, situations where the case helps the students derive or come to the facts instead of presenting the facts as is, as it is. Um, because when you present them a situation and don't present them a fact, they are able to think. Then they are able to convince others on the decisions that they have made. So when you do a class discussion on a well-written case, you will realize that students are debating amongst each other. And when they debate, they are trying to convince everybody else that whatever decision they have made is the right decision. So they, in the process, learn to analyze situations accurately, and of course, to be able to give arguments, because whenever we analyze case studies, it's not like comprehension passages where we are giving answers to questions, but we are giving reasons to why our answers are what we intend to give them. Um, so, um, you know, uh, of course, cases will never be linear structures, right? So when I say linear structures, and they are absolutely non-linear, uh, they are, they are non-linear, the idea why I'm telling you this is there necessarily does not have to be a logical sequence to what you're writing, okay? So when you sequence the case studies, when you write the case studies, you may be sequencing them according to chronological order. You may be sequencing them according to the thought process of the manager. You may be sequencing them according to how situation went from one place to the other, but it may not be necessarily logical, which means that case studies provide students an opportunity to read between the lines. And that's what we always tell them. The moment we give them a case study, we always emphasize read between the lines, lead between the lines. So what is it? It is basically this, that we have given you a content. You probably have to create a linear structure of facts, okay? Now, again, don't get me wrong when I say you create the case study non-linear. I'm saying that the facts should be non-linear, but when you create the case study, it should be like a story. So it could be as a sequence, um, as a chronological sequence, or as a sequence when, um, you know, you are talking about uh, the manager or you're talking about the CEO or whosoever is the protagonist of the case. Um, whereas it could also be the explanation of the situation, what happened from when to when. So that's a linear structure that we create in terms of writing the case study. But when it comes to analysis, the analysis is not a linear structure and there's definitely a gap in the understanding. Um, so uh, when I say a gap, I also uh, mean to indicate that there is some amount of inferential information, information that is not presented as it is, but it has to be inferred. For example, I want the students to calculate, um, say, profits before tax or profits after tax, or I want, I am do, I'm doing an analysis where I'm trying to analyze um, what is the pitch that advertising agencies have made for my um, product promotion or communication, and I, I really want to evaluate it out. So there is one uh, agency who's given um, the pitch in the format of market expansion um, and then, uh, you know, sales. There's somebody else who talks about profits and uh, sales. There is somebody else who talks about new customers, existing customers, and then they talk about how this pitch is going to help both the existing and the, um, you know, new customers. So everybody has given a different format. Now, I write it as it is. 
but then I expect the student to be able to infer information. So get air, air, all these pitches on a common ground, right? So probably on the basis of target market or on the basis of total profits or on the basis of, um, you know, um, in, in, the, in, the, in the format of new market uh, expansion. So whatever is the basis on which you would like to do it, you can do it. Students have different options to go ahead with that. But then this information is scattered. One, two, the information is such which is not presented as such just like facts. So it's more of something that you infer out of it. Uh, the, uh, when you write the case studies, uh, again, when we say you write it as a story or you write it as a you know um, sequence of events, the idea is uh, I'm not illogical, right? So there is some logic behind writing the case studies. But yes, uh, there is a possibility that the student gets confused. Normally, the students get confused when the case studies are extremely, extremely long. But then uh, uh, the idea behind it is uh, to help them keep going back to the case study facts and putting it together, summarizing it, creating a mind map out of it. That's extremely essential when you do the case analysis. Create, tell the students to make a mind map. Tell the students to create a mind map, even if it's a brief caselet. Because when you create a mind map, you are putting information um, in a particular logical sequence. And that is what is leading to perfect decision making. And that's exactly what I talk about when I say good habits of analysis. Um, case studies are definitely, you know, kind of opposite to synergy. So they are a whole that is less than the sum of its parts, right? So what do I mean is, a student should be able to segregate information that he will essentially be using for decisions and not be using for uh, um, you know, decisions. Sometimes when we give backgrounds about the company or background about the person or you know, sometimes some other information, it may not necessarily be relevant for decision making. One, two, multiple case studies um, are created uh, which are organization based and they can be utilized in multiple functional areas. So when you're doing the analysis from a marketing perspective or maybe, um, you know, a, a marketing communication perspective, um, it may not essentially be incorporating um, the, the aspects of branding. It may not essentially be incorporating uh, the aspects of sales management, but somebody else is trying to analyze it and use it for a sales class. Um, you know, you may try and ignore marketing communication. You just, just say, this is just the contribution of marketing communication, but I'm not going into the history of the whole thing, which means that a case study can offer you one avenues for um, analyzing the case study from different perspectives and two, um, the student an idea of how to segregate between information that is essentially required and information that can be skipped on. Uh, this is exactly what happens in real real time situations. We are in today's time overloaded with information. Um, then, you know, earlier times we would say, I'm not informed. I don't know this. I don't know that. Today we have so much information. But the problem is the major issue today is how do you segregate between data that is required and data which is not required. So this case study writing, um, you know, when you write case studies, you have to be aware about this. You can kind of put in certain uh, points or certain uh, topics uh, which may not be directly relevant to a particular functional head, but may be relevant to some other functional area. So um, a case writing is something which is replete with facts, uh, essentially, information, uh, which can be derived um, uh, to be able to assist effective decision-making and not essentially shaped into a single truth, which means that there should not be essentially one right answer. It could be a suggestive thing, which we normally write as a teaching note, or maybe um, you know, follow it up with a part B case, but then uh, case studies are not meant for um, coming to a right answer or a wrong answer. Case studies is something that is important in terms of utilizing it as a process and helping the student arrive to a decision which may or may not be always right or wrong.
So when you write um, cases, um, you know, uh, I'm sure uh, everybody is keen on writing cases. Uh, case studies are essential because, uh, you know, they help the faculties with tools which help uh, them, you know, kind of uh, not only enhance the analytical skills of the students, but also their own analytical skills. Um, uh, you know, sometimes it's extremely boring to, um, you know, come to a subject uh, knowledge uh, just as a lecture class or maybe just an activity class or an assignment class. But case classes are definitely more dynamic in nature. And um, so many times when, um, you know, um, as uh, heads of institutions, we do feedbacks with the students, we realize that they may not remember what we did um, in the lecture, but we, they definitely remember the case studies that they did. So, so many times uh, I have received feedbacks on my subject and I see feedbacks of my colleagues and, um, you know, students do definitely write in that we remember the case study that we, this case study that we did in the class, X case study, Y case study. Um, and uh, it really perfectly works as a teaching vehicle. So uh, just to give you my own reference, so I was doing this course on, um, you know, a kind of insight into India um, as a part of my international uh, marketing sessions. And uh, I decided to do completely case studies in India. And that methodology, which we completely, um, you know, utilized during the course, we realized that we could touch upon different sectors because when we talk about something like India, it's very broad. So you have the social sectors, the economic sectors, the cultural sectors, um, you have the business in India, uh, political systems, so on and so forth. This, it, the list is, um, you know, never ending list. But we could touch upon various sectors and we could touch upon various areas of discussion just because we were utilizing different kind of case studies. So, you know, that helped me as well as the students to be able to you know kind of understand away uh, sectors so this is um, you know case studies also is a very essential way or a methodology wherein you can expose the student to different sectors when they do the case study they are definitely analyzing that sector so you know pick up case studies or write case studies in sectors which you feel the students should essentially be um, you know, looking at or should be abreast with. Um, for teachers, definitely, um, uh, you know, this happened with me also because in the very beginning of my career, I did not have uh, too much of corporate experience. So I was a fresh uh, postgraduate and I went into teaching. I used to find it difficult to be able to bridge the gap between teaching concepts and corporates. So when I uh, started doing case writing, that also helped me get insights into what is happening in the corporate. So whenever we would go for a research-based case study, when we will enter into corporates, we will understand what is it that they are doing and then, you know, kind of replicate the same thing in your teaching. So case writing definitely assists you in excelling your own lectures, right? So do case writing for, do, for that. Um, now, I have a very small... Um, um, uh, survey that I want to do with you. So what I'll do is I will copy this link and paste it for you. Just a minute. So I hope all of you are able to see the chat. Is the chat disabled? Is the chat chat disabled, sir? Ma'am, we are enabling this. Thank you, sir. Just a second, sir. I'm doing it. Just a second. It is on now. Okay. Mm, no. No. Okay. Yep. Yes, sir. So uh, this is a Mentimeter survey. And uh, I would really appreciate if you could answer this survey so that we are able to understand uh, what do people think. So 
uh, what I have posed a question to you is why do you want to write a case study? Are you able to reach that uh, uh, page? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Uh, it is showing me access denied. Uh, ma'am, I'm able to, like, I'm on that page where okay. it is asking, why do you want to write a case? Good. Yes, ma'am. Same. It's active. Uh, sir, I think uh, my sharing rights have gone again. No, ma'am, you are the. It is on. It is on. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I hope you're able to see the responses that everybody's writing. Okay, so it says skill building, wonderful practical knowledge, academic outreach, understand decision making, learn practical exposure, learn writing skills. Okay, that's nice. Comparative study. current scenarios, exposure to corporate, definitely influential, yes. Industrial gap, industrial gap analysis, that's nice. Describing situation, getting practical exposure, solving real time problems. Wonderful. So are you all able to see this? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So, um, you know, probably that also gives you a motivation on, uh, you know, writing case studies. So I'm so happy to see that people at least know why they want to write case studies. You've been able to arrive, um, you know, to a conclusion that why you want to be right, uh, you know, uh, writing case studies. Uh, so I go back to this and I have come to my presentation. Okay, this is something that we've done. Maybe I'll share this screen with you later. So, uh, when, um, you know, most um, you know, common answers that you could actually receive it, of course, effective teaching. So a lot of people feel that case studies is something that you are able to uh, utilize for effective teaching. Um, you end up getting a lot of popularity. So you're, if you're able to publish good case studies, um, it really helps you um, in, you know, kind of climbing up the ladder, ladder of uh, publication. It is definitely knowledge sharing and uh, for it forms a very essential part of publications. I'm sure all of your institutions that you're part part uh, participating in uh, would be going in for, um, you know, NAC accreditations and NIRF accreditations and NBA accreditations, or in fact, for that matter, even when you go and look at the global standards, your publications definitely form a very important part of your profile, of your academic profile, and that's the reason why uh, publications really matter. Um, your popularity also lands up because so many students know you as a case author. So uh, you're basically trying to develop cases and some of the other reasons why people also develop cases is because, um, you know, um, this is what motivated me sometimes to write case studies is um, I realize I want to teach a topic and I want the students to be understanding it as an example. So when I teach marketing, examples are an essential part of marketing. And it's always a good, good idea if I can give an example in the form of a case study. So I would create my own case studies because I wanted to fill a gap. When I created, um, you know, new curriculum, uh, when we were in the process of uh, upgrading our curriculum or creating new courses or new electives, which I would be launching, that's the time when I would feel that there is a dearth of cases in that area. And that's the time when I started writing um, caselets. And there are so many caselets which I've written specifically for classroom teaching only. Um, 
a lot of textbooks give you case studies, but sometimes the textbooks talk about um, periods which are foregone. So as a marketing person, I never like using case studies which are not contemporary. So a case study which has data of 200 and, uh, you know, 2000, 2003, um, I do not like to use that case study because it's not contemporary anymore. There's so much that has happened after that. Um, there are times when your theory is very well explained in a case study, but that case study is 2013 and the company is completely gone now. So I don't like using that case study. So sometimes to replace um, a good case study, which was very, very relevant, but it was old, you can create a case study in that particular area. So again, I'm giving you ideas on um, deciding which are the areas where you can actually position your case study? Um, sometimes there are contemporary topics, topics which have not been brooded upon, topics which are still in the form of development. For example, when blockchain came in, um, a lot of people started writing case studies on blockchain because people did not know what blockchain is. People did not understand, for example, very recently we were doing a brief case study. I was assisting somebody on applications of artificial intelligence in healthcare industry. So we actually wrote it for our corporate. And uh, um, uh, the reason why we had to write that case study is because there was nothing that is available in that area. People are talking about too much of applications of AI in um, you know, engineering, automobile, um, you know, retail, but people are not talking about applications of AI in healthcare, whereas there are so many applications. So we decided to write a case study on that. So you're trying to provide material to students in topics which are very, very contemporary. And we actually wrote these case studies for students who were into medical administration, right? So they are the people, and of course, medical students. So medical students do not understand immediately when they're in their bachelors, but then students who have moved into, into their post-graduation or students who are into hospital administration definitely understand and appreciate the applications of AI and how they'll be able to manage their hospitals better. So that's the place where we required this kind of a positioning and there was no content that was available. It was becoming extremely difficult for us to help students understand and take up that um, subject or that course as an elective or as an optional subject or take up certificate programs in that area. And that's where we provided this material to them. And um, as a self-development activity, you should be able to understand, okay, my interest area is X, Y, Z. And that's the place I want to write my case study. Um, and when you write a, your case study, uh, as I mentioned, it's very difficult to be able to abridge your complete set of readings into a small case study. But while you're doing that, the amount of research that goes um, in that particular sector, in that particular topic, or in that particular concept, that is something that actually skills uh, professors ahead. Um, so while you are creating or writing your case study, um, the idea is, uh, you know, immediately, as I said, I'll be emphasizing more in academic case studies. So when you talk about teaching cases, um, the teaching case um, should suit your teaching style, right? What is your teaching style? How do you derive at concepts? Should you begin from the end and go to the beginning or you begin from the beginning and intermittently talk about topics here and there and then um, you know kind of conclude your topic so when you write your case study you can match your case studies along with the type of teaching style that you have uh, for example you know um, i normally start my class with conclusions okay so i tell them a situation that okay uh, this is what i used for example if i'm teaching a market research uh, class, uh, probably I will start by talking to them about how I used um, this particular tool to come to this decision. And then I tell them, what is the tool? Um, how do you use these tools? What is the comparison of these tools with the other tools that are available in market research collection, so on and so forth? Um, somebody has a question? Or is this just by chance? I'm sorry? Okay, maybe it's uh, it's just by chance. Um, cases should always be classroom tested. Okay, uh, so um, when you are creating case studies, when you're writing case studies, always ensure that before sending it for publication or before sending it or making it public on your own website, 
test the case. When you test the case, uh, you are able to understand the mistakes in the case. Mistakes in terms of what could be the probable mistakes that you could make. So you could make mistakes on providing information which is incomplete to reach the decisions, right? Um, not essentially every information or every fact should be given in the form of figures. So there's not essentially a data that is required. You could mention something related to the data in the text. How do you do that? For example, I want to calculate, um, you know, um, contributions. Okay. Uh, so I'm talking about sales and I'm talking about profits and I've given some balance sheet, but I have not mentioned the percentage of contribution that each SKU is offering. But in the case study, I have mentioned some X amount and I say that this product is giving twice as much contribution as uh, Y product. And this uh, Y product is giving uh, one third of contribution of the Z product. And if I put these two products together, they go always well hand in hand. So there is something which is cross selling that is happening there. So you've given that in the text. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to, um, you know, kind of uh, stimulate the students to put these two things together. So there's something which is given in the text and there is something which is given in the data and you're trying to make them um, put this all thing together but when you test the case you realize that that x amount was an x amount you didn't give a figure to that so it is becoming very difficult for the students to interpret how should do should, should they put that as calculation so you should know that that x amount has to be written as um, a 10 percent or a 15 percent whatever way that you want to be writing it or you want to give it in you know, inr or you want to give it in some other format, whatever currency that denomination that you're using, you should be able to talk about that, right? So when you test the case, you are able to find out missing data. You are able to find out whether the students are able to reach the same conclusions which you are intending them to read. You will be able to find out that this case study can be utilized in which, which, which area. And of course, the most essential thing is it will help you improve your teaching note, which is sometimes um, in fact, now it has become essential for publication. Most publications today will not accept your case study for publication without a teaching note. So you are able to develop your teaching note well and test it out if you're doing the um, case study testing in the classrooms. Um, objectivity in terms of um, unbiased decisions, right? So, so many times we also talk about the backgrounds of the of the companies. We talk about, uh, for example, um, you know, we were discussing a case on Patanjali uh, in my one of my classes. And suddenly I never thought that this topic will come up, but then there was a lot of uh, political um, issues and there was a lot of talk about uh, Ramdev Baba and uh, his background and so on and so forth, which I never thought that will come to the class um, with respect to the case study that we were discussing, but that happened. So when we um, get into that kind of class discussions, we are able to understand whether the case is objectively taken or not. And if it is not, what are the things that you should be writing in the case study so that it makes the case study more objective? For example, we realize that we should have mentioned this, how, what is the contribution of brand Ramdev Baba on the brand Patanjali and vice versa? Uh, is he the only reason why this brand exists? What is his contribution to other brands? Um, his contribution in terms of his political network to the brand worth, um, you know, lots and lots of these kind of things have to be probably explicitly mentioned in the case study. So we did mention that, yes, because you know, his posture or his stature in the society is such that he's been able to. So his brand is larger than the brand Patanjali and he's contributing more to the brand rather than the brand contributing to him. So we gave hints on that so that the case becomes more objective. Sometimes when you are, uh, you know, developing a teaching case, you also have to figure out whether it fits with the publication. So, um, you know, in case if you're writing a case study specifically targeting a publication, um, you know, you should be able to um, kind of uh, figure it out. Okay, this publication requires this kind of a format. Uh, so if um, I wonder whether time will permit me or not, but if it permits me, I will definitely try and talk to you about the different formats that are required for different uh, type of publications. And of course, um, teaching cases have to be something that the students are able to understand. Uh, where does your case information come from? So your case information could come from a narrative. 
it could come from um, you know the protagonist so the narrative is um, when you are basically trying to talk about a chronological order of how the company went through certain phases so what did they do first next 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 um, the protagonist is the key person um, in the case study and of course you could also be using um, learning objectives so i will quickly take you through um, you know cases so um i hope you are able to see my screen and you are able to see amazon.com yes ma'am right uh, so this is basically um, a narrative case where uh, the focus is on the brand and this basic this case study basically talks about what happened to um, the business so they have spoken about what happened to the business um, in between 1997 and 1999 so that's a narrative again a story this is what happened with the company this is what all they did and then between 2000 to 2003 what did they do and then um, it keeps going on to talk about what happened later in 2005 and then how did they enter different markets uh, they use digital media and then they entered the um, um, you know, different countries. So they decided to move into China, they decided to move into India, and they also launched different new categories. So this is an example of a narrative case. Whereas this case, which is about Juhi Warrior, this is again, Juhi Warrior is who is, she's the protagonist, okay? So this case study talks about the protagonist, the lady, um, uh, you know, uh, around whom the case has, the story has been built up, right? Um, so we, she, the case begins with talking about who Juhi Warrior is. So, you know, she's an HR leader and then about um, her her journey in uh, in the corporate uh, what happened to her and then what was she doing currently um, what are the roles and responsibilities that she had and then how she improvised the roles and responsibilities and then of course how she landed into um, a particular situation where she was kind of thinking what is the next thing that she need to be, needs to be doing uh, so this is an example of um, uh, a, a case study which is based on um, a narrative, right? Uh, of course, when I talk about teaching and learning objectives, I'll take you through certain teaching and learning objectives and we will look at uh, what kind of cases are there. So now uh, I'm gonna be talking about the different types of cases, but uh, uh, this is something that I do for your understanding. Essentially, when we send it for publication or when we use it in the classrooms, uh, it, it's not necessarily that you have to classify it like that, one, two. Uh, when we talk about the LO base, uh, so LO, uh, you know, is related to, I'll, I'll also talk about the Bloom's taxonomy and how you can decide which case will go where. Another uh, thing is when you write the case, uh, sometimes uh, long, there are, the cases are extremely, extremely long and you don't want to be utilizing those long cases. In that case, you can also split the case and say, okay, today I'm doing a particular topic, which is just awareness related. So I'm just creating knowledge or awareness of the concept. So I'm going to do an iceberg case, right? So an iceberg case, basically a case study, wherein you are just trying to talk about a conceptual model. For example, when I teach um, Porter's model of competition, I use an iceberg case and I, I, I tell them that, okay, um, um, I'm going to launch, um, say, um, vegetarian pasta, okay, vegan pasta, okay, uh, so I'm going to launch vegan pasta and uh, for that, I need to be understanding uh, what is going to be my uh, uh, my competitive scenario and that's where the students are trying to apply or use the portals model of competition and create uh, the competitive scenario so I when I give the case study I basically just give them a basic concept and I say okay this is what I'm going to be doing um, and I'm stuck into understanding that uh, how should I differentiate my product? And of course, when you are talking about differentiation of the product, you have to be essentially doing a competitive analysis. So this is where an iceberg case would come into play, completely, completely based on conceptual models, right? The other is when you're talking about incident cases. So incident cases are primarily cases 
experiences which are um, you know related to a particular time and place right so this thing happened at this this kind of place so um yes you are talking about the context you are talking about the context in terms of the context of the corporate or context of the person or context of what has happened earlier with him or her but then um you know uh, you uh, um, are uh, uh, just um, circumscribing or you're just kind of emphasizing the incident that happened. Um, this is an example of an incident case where you're just saying that there's a person, there's a worker who died and um, this was the height of the scaffold, al aluminum scaffold, and these people got hurt. Um, this was the voltage. So this is basically a production unit where you are trying to teach your safety managers or your um, production managers uh, to help them understand what is it that they should be taking care of. And if there is an incident like this that has happened, how do you identify um, safety points, or how do you rectify a situation wherein this kind of a, this kind of an incident does not repeat? So you have to understand what are the areas that you have to be evaluating. So this is completely incident, incidental in nature. So this is an incident case where you are trying to help students analyze information, put together the information to arrive at a situation wherein the incident probably has happened. Then we have illustrative cases. So what are illustrative cases? Illustrative cases are cases which basically probably, you know, um, uh, uh, it's more of best practices case. So there's some company who did X, Y, Z, and they were extremely successful. There's another company which did X, Y, Z, and they were complete failure. So what you're trying to do is an illustrative case, you are trying to help the students understand this is what you did. And they were successful in this situation. And this is this, this what you did. They were not so successful. So basically, you are trying to tell them best practices. It's a very good idea to tell the students best practices. But as a teacher, um, I also introduce my students to what not to do rather than just telling them what to do. Um, um, you know, correctly. So uh, you could also use illustrative cases. And it's a good idea to create these kind of cases wherein we are suggesting, of course, it's a difficult to get data on such kind of cases, especially if you're doing a research-based case. It's difficult to get data, but then it's definitely useful for the students to be able to understand what we should not be doing. Then there are cases which are head cases. So uh, head cases are cases um, which uh, you know are based upon the protagonist and uh, uh, the things that have revolved around the protagonist. For an example, the, the example that I gave you uh, just now. Um, so um, um, okay, uh, let me also take you to some cases. So. So this is a case of illustrative uh, case studies, wherein this is a case study based on a company called Canada Goose. Um, this was a family owned uh, business and how uh, they actually created a homegrown, a small family owned business into a luxury brand. And this is a complete, um, you know, kind of uh, illustration or, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, understanding of how a family enterprise can be created into becoming a global brand, uh, something that is known uh, today as um, um, a kind of a must have for people who are um, enduring severe winters. And then this is a case on, uh, this is a head case. So this this lady called Mia Foster, this is a case study on Levendry Cafe, um, um, a, a case where uh, the complete case study is designed or created or written, uh, keeping Mia Foster in place. So what happened to Mia Foster? What was her background? Um, what is it she what is it that she's doing right now? Um, and of course, with a very specific context to the company. So it begins from the lady. It goes on to talk about the company. It talks about the foundations. It talks about the cafe in China. It talks about the other actor in the case study or upon which Mia Foster has to be making a decision. And then finally kind of ends in this. So I'll just quickly take you here um, and tell you about this, that this case study basically ends into the same place where um, Mia Foster's and Louis Chen, who's the other actor of the case study, 
are meeting and what they are going to be uh, deciding or what is the next action that's going to happen. So, uh, you know, uh, when we talk about a head case study, when you have a protagonist around which you want to build up the story, begin from the protagonist and end at the protagonist, okay? Now, again, there's some data, which I thought maybe um, it will be useful for you to be able to view and understand how we write these uh, um, you know, data. So this is some data which has been mentioned here where you are talking about the income statements. And then, of course, you're talking about how um, uh, there's a contribution that is made from different um, uh, products, uh, top products. Uh, what is the traffic? Uh, what is the average uh, uh, you know, bill amount that people are paying, the average bill amount, and how is it that you're retrieving your sales out of it? So uh, China and a US um, comparison has been made. And uh, of course, uh, the students are left to figure out which is the best menu, which menu can you replicate from China to US and vice versa. Uh, when we talk about the seats or when we talk about the average traffic, is the bill amount, average bill amount more for which kind of a um, uh, you know outlet or what is it that we should do to improve it? For example, here, when you look at it, you realize that um, the China uh, uh, outlets uh, are having a lower average check um, which is an indicator that probably you need to increase something in terms of premiumness or the product range that you're offering, uh, relook at the pricing strategy. So this is something that the students should be able to understand, evaluate, and comment on um, when you, uh, you are doing this case analysis. Right? Then comes what is a, called a dialogue case. Um, a dialogue case, um, easy to write, extremely easy to write, um, is effective because you are showing two, uh, you know, parts of the same picture. So it's like, uh, you know, going, coming, going, coming. And these two individuals who are probably debating with each other um, on the common grounds or on two different grounds and you're trying to, you know, understand the perspective of both these people and then kind of surface out uh, the dynamics between the actor or the consequences of their own decisions, so on and so forth. And then there are application cases. So application cases are cases which uh, specifically require students to use a particular technique. Okay, So I'll give you examples for both of these case studies. So this is a dialogue case, which is very, very simple. And it is a case, uh, it's a dialogue between a customer and a salesperson, uh, a very simple uh, kind of a dialogue which has been created. So as to help you, help students understand uh, what is the consumer decision-making process that the uh, customer passes through? How should you lead the customer to sales? How do you cross sell? So all these, you know, kind of stuff that you talk about. So, um, you know, um, how, do, how does the salesperson interpret the customer? What should you expect? What kind of questions that you should be asking? So when you are creating a case study, something on sales skills, you could use these kind of, uh, um, you know, uh, cases which are uh, dialogue cases. And I'll give you an example of, So this is where you are using a particular concept. This is a case study on Ethiopia. And uh, the reason uh, why I'm saying a particular technique or a concept was required to be uh, done was there's a very specific um, you know, uh, identification of um, factors that require to be utilized. So there's a very clear mention of, so this is a case study which I had written. Um, this is a, a very clear mention of um, what factors should the students be using? So there's infrastructure, there's HR, there's competition. And then there are four things that have been mentioned. So these are the four entry options that the customer, uh, that the company has. And you have to kind of evaluate um, your company. So there are three companies which have been mentioned. One is a medical company, one is a shoe company, and one is a consumer products company. And based upon your analysis of the environment, so you have to necessarily be doing a pestle analysis, and then you have to be evaluating the market on entry options by doing a sectoral analysis of the country. This is something where you require a complete technique to be utilized. And that is why, um, you know, uh, uh, this uh, kind of a case becomes quite interesting uh, for the students. Then we have cases which are database cases. 
uh, where, um, you know, there is so much of information that has been provided. And a good way is um, to use it in situations where, uh, or create it in situations where you are asking the students to evaluate between alternatives. For example, um, as I said, you know, market entry options. So live in um, Ethiopia case. Uh, in that case, if you are able to provide an Excel with some data points, you will be able to let the students understand what is going to be the break-even time, what is going to be the tenure when you'll be able to break even, what is the possible profit projections that you will be seeing, what is the possible, um, um, you know, incidental cost that you may be having apart from the cost related to production and uh, marketing, any incidental cost that you are able to see. So these kind of case studies are very, very data prone. Or for example, as I mentioned, when you're trying to evaluate between options related to advertising. So I'm trying to evaluate whether should I advertise, um, should I use billboards, should I use digital marketing, should I use um, you know, TV ads, so on and so forth. For everything, there's a reach, there's a frequency. Um, every media has um, a cost related to it. And I'm trying to figure out what is the least cost that I get per person or per contact per, um, you know, reach, um, uh, what is the cost that I'm going to incur? Will I be able to uh, retrieve frequency? Will I be able to have a consistency of my media? So I'm trying to evaluate it using an Excel sheet. That's a data case. And the most, most popular interesting cases are problem solving cases. In fact, today, most of the times that we are using or writing case studies are problem solving case studies where we Put, we give them a background, we put the students into a situation, and we force them to implement actions. Um, then there are, of course, uh, uh, prediction or sequential uh, case studies. So this is basically, uh, you know, you've just given information. And then you want the student to be able to understand behavior. So in terms of the unit or the person, as well as the performance. Sometimes case studies could be extremely broad, as I mentioned, sometimes I do case studies related to um, a global or a country wise phenomena. In that case, I'm giving a very, um, I'm giving information which is moderately structured, and uh, we are trying to understand the dynamics of this, uh, um, you know, kind of a um, uh, scenario. Uh, again, I'll take you to through case studies, uh, which will help you understand what kind of case study am I talking about. So this is a case study um, on women entrepreneurs, which we uh, did. And uh, this basically is a, is a story. So there's a story about a lady called Devi. And this is another story about the lady called Kumari. And the idea behind this was to help students understand uh, the structure of grassroots entrepreneurs. So how especially uh, women grassroots entrepreneurs in India um, who are having severe, even more severe problems as compared to their male counterparts. Uh, what kind of issues do they face and uh, how, uh, what kind of strategies do they use uh, to overcome this? So things like self-help groups, things like um, loans based upon policies which have been provided by the government, um, uh, loans or, you know, uh, kind of the local uh, uh, people who are able to provide money to them, how do they utilize the schemes given by the government, what is the role of the government, so on and so forth. So these two stories about these two women are basically uh, to kind of derive um, the structure that women entrepreneurs are actually enduring at this point of time in India. The other one, which I said is a kind of a phenomena is um, universal basic income. So universal basic income operates different ways in different countries. And uh, this case study, of course, also um, uh, is an example of or gives you an idea about what is happening in other countries. But largely, it talks about the economic situation of our country, talks about um, what is the concept of universal basic income, why is it required, what are the challenges if we apply this to our country, in what format and or, or in which phases should we apply it. And it leaves the case at a position where the students are uh, required to kind of think about whether this is really a concept that will be it will be possible to apply in India. Will it work in India? And, you know, um, should you really think about using this kind of a concept in India? Okay. 
Uh, so I kind of uh, would want you to quickly take a look at this Bloom's taxonomy. So this is something I'm sure all of you know about it. But again, why I wanted to tell you is because um, when you are using a case study, you can think about it. So when we have knowledge, uh, you could you be using an iceberg case where you are, whereas when you're talking about an evaluation, you could be using a problem solving case. When you're talking about application, what kind of case studies should you be using? So uh, I leave you with this idea. These are the types of case studies, and this is your Bloom's taxonomy. Which taxon which case study would you be using for which kind of a um, you know Bloom's uh, level? And of course, uh, as I said, this is just for your understanding. Um, it may not be necessarily required to be explained to the students or for publication. Um, there are cases which can be used at multiple levels, but then it also helps you understand which part of the case should I be using. So you could also be using this is another thing that we do. So many times I use a single case and I move the students through all the stages of Bloom's taxonomy. So I break the cases into parts. The first part could be um, a concept based part when I want them to do a particular analysis. Then I take them through more of data analysis cases or application when I'm doing application with them. When I'm doing analysis with them, I put them into situation based cases or sometimes when I'm doing a synthesis, I put them into um, a, a head case where there's a protagonist and the student has to understand what are the issues that the protagonist is um, you know, facing. And then finally, I put them into a problem and I tell them, OK, um, this is the problem, this is the protagonist, this is the uh, analysis that you've already done. Now you tell me, how will you come out of this problem? So you have to actually find a root out of it. So that's another way that you can actually be writing cases. So when you write a case, you could break the case on the basis of the Bloom's taxonomy, utilize different types of cases, or you could also write a comprehensive case uh, uh, which includes all these aspects. Uh, with this, uh, you know, probably uh, it's 8-8. Eight, eight, and uh, is it okay if we take a five minutes break? Would you like to take a five minutes break? Okay, ma'am. Yeah, and we come back? Yes, yes, ma'am.
So can we start? Yes, ma'am. Wonderful. Just a minute. Okay, I hope my screen is visible and we can start. But before I start, uh, anybody has any questions? Uh, anything that you um, have in your mind that you would like to discuss? Uh, I'm open to your questions. Um, may I ask a question? Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Yeah, uh, ma'am, uh, I just want to know, I just want to have your insight that at present our pedagogies revolve around uh, our students dealing with ready-made cases, which we taught them in the class. So I just want to know that how we can, you know, level up our students for making them, you know, how to brew the cases or how to write the cases by their own. Uh, okay, uh, so... One, right now, the idea is that once the faculty start writing their cases, they know the technique, it's easier for you to let your students do it. The other way is, I'm sure you must be having some projects or some field um, things related to your subject, especially when we look at marketing uh, courses, all of them have something which is related to, um, you know, kind of practical assessment of some projects or something. So what you can yeah. tell them to do is when they go for, say, surveys or when they go to a company or, for example, if you have industrial visits, you yes, can sir. ask them to, uh, you know, frame a case based upon their industrial visit. Right. Tell, divide your class into groups and tell them when you meet the finance guy, ask him certain questions which will help you understand what are the best practices of the company. Um, this, there's one group that can you know, look at what are the issues with the labor or what are the issues, HR related issues. There is another group who could just uh, do a secondary research and try to find out what are the challenges that um, say the brand is facing or the marketing department is facing. So um, this is a very easy way or for example, uh, when I was working for Symbiosis, uh, I, we used to, uh, for our retail students, essentially have trips um, uh, to retail stores, uh, organized as well as unorganized retails. Uh, something like a, a unique thing like exhibitions, which is a very a unique format for small and medium enterprises to showcase their products. So whenever we would send our students, we would essentially ask them to write a case on any one uh, store of that exhibition ask them certain questions and try and create a case study related to that. So these are small caselets. You can begin case with sets, yes. a, a half page or a one page for the students. They can actually work in groups and come up with the situation. They can come up with uh, maybe the, a protagonist based case or a situation based case and tell them, or, you know, simple questions. So research based cases or question based cases is something that the students will definitely be able to write and they will enjoy writing it. So I, I, I guess uh, this can be uh, included as a part of their assignments or maybe Very research much. projects, which we are already having. Yes, why but not? we can get them done from this perspective as well. Why not? And then what you can actually do is as a faculty, you can compile all these case case lets into a long case study. So you have your finance, marketing, HR, so on and so forth. Put it together, add your students as authors and get it published uh, which is an advantage to your organization, your institution also. Yeah, so sure, sure. You know, uh, start doing this stepwise with whatever existing activities that your students are doing, especially with students who are in their internships, uh, students who are on their on-job trainings. Uh, those, those are the students who can essentially write case studies. Yes, yes. Got it, got it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good Any evening, ma'am. Yes, sir. Uh, myself, Mayang Jain. Hello. Uh, I am teaching tax planning and management. Okay. So when I create a case regarding the particular individual resides for some days, so how much will be a taxable income? So will it come under problem solving case? 
Uh, this is more uh, based upon technique and calculation. But yes, you can uh, definitely create a problem solving case. When you put the person into a situation where he's trying to analyze something like this. So I have, uh, I, I have uh, my sales guy uh, who spends some time in India and he spends some time in say um, any European country uh, or in the US. Now in the US, the taxation system is very different from the taxation system in India, but he's filing his taxes in India. So, or maybe he's filing his taxes taxes in US. So what is the comparison or what would you be advising him? Where should he be filing the taxes? So on what premise you will be uh, deciding this uh, uh, criteria? Will it be on his employment? Will it be on his deputation? Will it be on, for example, IT and ITS companies? They send so many of their employees onshore and those employees are paid by the client but they are employed in your company. In that case, how will the taxation be filed? That is more of a problem solving case. Uh, my question was, ki, you said ki all cases are based on real facts, but this can be imaginative also. Yes, very much. You can create hypothetical situations. Okay. But then the hypothetical situation should not be something which is not related to reality at all. Okay. Thank so you. something which you would like to create as a situation, you can do that, but put the facts in place. For example, in this case study, I will definitely put facts related to uh, the US taxation and their rules and regulations. I will put uh, facts related to uh, how IT and ITS companies create contracts for their employees who are going onshore. Um, what is the HR policy that they have? Um, taxation uh, norms related to India. And of course, I leave some space for the students to be able to collect data and then compile and compare it. Okay. Thank you so much. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, ma'am. Hello. Good evening. This side, Ruchi Mantri. Uh, ma'am, there is one query that, uh, that Hindenburg's report on Adani Enterprises Ma'am, will it come under issue-based case? This is not a case. A report is not a case study. So it doesn't if, leave if scope we make for... A, if you make a case on this report and this all situation... then If I was in your place, I would make a case study on Adani and not okay. on the report. Okay. <laughs> Good Thank evening. You, Thank you for suggesting. Thank you. Yes, can I ask a question, ma'am? Yes, please, ma'am. Yeah. So, ma'am... Um, like I'm very eager to write cases since a very long time and being coming from a HR background, I've worked with multiple companies and especially in retail sector. So I have so many problem solving situations or maybe the issue based case or the situation based case. I have so many, you know, real time situations which I have experienced myself, but there are some issue uh, challenges which I face uh, in writing a case. The first thing is uh, the formats, obviously okay. uh, formats, how to, you know, write a case in which format. And secondly, the assistance, like such sessions are very, very helpful to give us the insights of how to write a case, but still we, you know, require some assistance, you know, whether, whether to take this kind of a situation for a case or not. And thirdly, uh, my, uh, you know, question is or my uh, doubt is that uh, whether do we need to take required permissions from the companies on which we are trying to write a case or we just you know use xyz company or things like that okay so i'll answer your question sequentially uh, your first question is related to structure of the case so um, in the next part of this part two of my presentation i will be giving you some idea about the structure of the case Yes, of course, I may not be able to explain everything in the short span of time that I'm given, but I will try and touch upon these uh, points in terms of the structure of the case more importantly. Point number two is assistance in terms of, uh, you know, um, whether it is right or wrong, um, you have good experience. Plus, it's a good idea to collaborate with senior writers, senior professors who have been into case writing. They will be able to help you or guide you. You can always look for um, people who are ready to 
um, you know, so what we actually suggest is it's a good idea. You write a case and give it to your colleague and tell them to read the case. So some, sometimes that's extremely useful. Uh, they'll be able to give you insights. And when you test the cases amongst a set of faculties, so your uh, institute would definitely be having more faculties in HR. Um, you can collaborate with them, ask them to read your case and tell whether it's something which is interesting, intriguing, and something which leads to um, uh, analysis and knowledge gain for the students or not. And I the heard part, yes. you saying that uh, you have been assisting somebody in writing the case. So that gave me an idea that, uh, you know, if that kind of assistance is available, uh, uh, uh ma'am uh, when i say assisting uh the person is my co-author all right uh, so uh i have co-authors along with whom i write case studies uh so it's a good idea if you can find a good co-author in your area and write a case study or even without your area also somebody who's been uh into a senior position and has written cases you can always approach them there are so many people who are ready to help you out right. and your third question uh is something which is very essential and i emphasize this uh this point uh, time and again, whenever you are using real-time data of a company, you have to essentially take permissions. Why is it required is not just because um, the company might object, but today when you want to publish a case study, uh, most of the publishing centers ask you or have performers wherein you will have to get the signatures and the seal of the people who are authorized to permit you to use their data. That's one. Two, if you are not using um, the name of the company as such, um, if you are kind of, uh, you know, not getting data from the company, but using secondary data, you have to essentially be showing the sources of the secondary data. Third, if you are just creating a situation which is hypothetical in nature, make sure that everything that you are writing is modified to an extent where the um, identification of the company becomes difficult. So there are okay. publications, even Richard Ivey, Harvard, Case Center, everywhere, um, Emerald also, they permit you to create cases which are hypothetical in nature, but then they, they ask you to write a declaration that this case study is written completely on hypothetical facts and does not relate to, uh, or does not let the readers identify which company um, we are referring to or where it's coming from. So uh, even when you talk about data, so if I'm putting a balance sheet, I have to make sure that all this information is um, you know, altered to an extent which does not affect decision making, but does not let the reader understand which company we are talking about. Um, even the location, the people that you're talking about, sometimes the structure of the company, everything has to be modified to an extent which uh, does not permit you. But then um, if you are looking at publication, ma'am, I would request you that you should essentially go for real-time situations. And it is not very difficult today. Uh, there's, a, there's a trick that a lot of times we use. Uh, the companies also leverage uh, from the case, cases which are written by uh, or, you know, academic uh, uh, you know, people like you and me. Uh, so they also leverage in terms of their brand. So that's a reason which you can actually quote um, sometimes, you know, uh, for example, I was collaborating with uh, one of my colleagues on uh, a case study, which is on Goli Vada Pao. And uh, this guy was very happy because just because of the fact that he was getting a leverage on that. And we, uh, you know, kind of created also videos. So I was in the team where we were trying to create videos related to him. That adds value to the um, brand. And that is a reason why you can actually convince the company to let you permit information um, related to the company. Yes, they will essentially require a draft. And only the draft that is approved by the company is something that you can submit for publication. Okay, so we cannot even mention that a famous departmental store uh, something like that we can all that's okay but the people the readers should not be able to essentially able to interpret which departmental store you're talking about so in the case study you say one famous departmental store and these are the competitors so obviously hmm. the name which is not mentioned in the competitor is the company that you're talking about right. so it should not be like that sure. thank you good so evening ma'am good evening ma'am this is dr chavi saxena I just want to ask one question. Suppose there is a series of incidents occurring uh, about a company and the news is coming in uh, times or something like that. And we are creating a narration out of it. It may be a Satyam scam. Presently, it is uh, Adani. 
and we are focusing on one issue maybe the hr maybe the financial or something like that and we put uh, the things uh, the times of india news uh, editions and the things in the bibliography part or reference part will it do will it be justifiable i am not copying the news as it is i am presenting it my in my own way as a case i have written many cases but uh, can it be uh, interpreted in a format of case Yes, ma'am. It can definitely be interpreted. Uh, the only thing is that you will be required to mention exactly as you said, as references or bibliography. Don't mention it as bi bibliography. Mention it as references wherever you picked up data from, whichever source that you're talking about. Uh, and but again, uh, you'll have to kind of figure out where. So, are you looking at publication or class usage? No, no. It, I'm looking for a publication. If you are looking at a publication, not everybody will publish these kind of cases. For example, Emerald uh, does not prefer to publish cases which are completely based on secondary data. They prefer to publish cases on which are completely based on primary data. But an eighty case study or a case center, you should be able to publish these kind of case studies. So again, uh, uh, probably you'll have to match your case study with the type of publication which is ready to accept this kind of a case study. But definitely, this forms a case. Okay, and you can Thank do you. that. Thank you. Uh, Shiju Shukla has raised his hand. Uh, is a question? I'm sorry, Shiji Shukla. That's fine. Yes, ma'am, Shiji Shukla. Yeah. Um, um, I have I've been into this FDP for the last three days. I need to understand one thing, which kind of you know makes me concerned a bit because uh, for the last two cases that I've been collaborated with. We usually go into domains like marketing, HR, uh, or even analytics and IT for that matters. Whenever I try and target in a case of finance, say for an example, into financial management or so, somehow while building the case or while attempting a case uh, in the classroom also, we know the end results, what, uh, what entails. So uh, at the end of the day, somehow I feel that these cases are not doing justice to what we exactly want to do with the case. So how to deal with such cases wh wherein the data plays a very crucial role and we know what end results or what discussions would lead to finally. Because in cases of HR marketing, there are multiple end solutions that students come up with, which gives a scope of discussion, brainstorming and everything in the class. But with finance thing, it becomes very, I don't know, kind of boring if I can say because we know what exactly the student will come up with right. so there is nothing, nothing to brainstorm as in such in that so how to create a very effective case in finance or financial administration or for that matter in financial management uh, so of course you're talking about a very difficult area it's difficult to write cases in finance because most companies decide not to uh, disclose their uh, financial data. So getting real-time data is definitely a challenge in the area of finance. And probably that's the reason why uh, very good cases are difficult to find in the uh, area of finance. Uh, what you would actually do is you could pick up a corporate case, which is institutional in mm -hmm. nature, or maybe even a marketing case, and then talk about um, the data or the finance oh. part of it. For example, I just mentioned to you about an example of the Leventry case, a cafe case study, where it is completely a calculation in terms of the accounting uh, factors, or maybe something where I say that you can understand or figure out the Ethiopia case where they could actually do Ooh. when will the break-even break analysis happen, or um, you know what are the units that you should be doing, uh, how should be you utilizing your supplies. So I'm, I agree with you when you say that um, cases related to maybe accounts or maybe related to final uh, final accounts or balance sheets and all they are very conclusive in nature because they are more calculated right exactly, uh, yeah. but then uh, those areas which you know kind of provide you a scope for um, letting the student evaluate for example uh, if I was in your place I could create a case study on uh, something like this um, my company has branches um, in Australia, in US, um, in uh, say Sweden, um, so on and so forth. And then I say that, okay, these are the accounting practices that I follow at the headquarters. This is what is the situation in Australia. This is what is the situation in US and this. And then 
try and help them understand what are the accounting practices that you will use at the headquarters and what are the accounting practices that you will use at each of the SBUs or each of the countries um, and then uh, help them understand how does that influence the total revenue uh, or the net worth of the company, how does it influence um, the share prices of the company, something like that could be something which is more debatable in nature. So um, uh, when you say that it's a difficult area, I absolutely echo your voice that finance is definitely a difficult area. Creating cases is a different, uh, difficult area because again, real-time data is not available. But then uh, you'll have to find um, places which you are talking to about. For example, when you do accounting principles, right? Mm. So you can mm -hmm. actually find places where these accounting principles um, conflict with each other. Create a sm uh, small caselet and let the students analyze how accounting principles contradict each other or how they contradict in a real-time situation. Or maybe, um, you know, uh, you could give them uh, a marketing data and help them understand how does it you know, you give them raw data, give them raw, completely raw data and tell them to create, um, and, you know, um, an expense sheet or an income sheet on the basis of this raw data. So let them do calculations related to contributions, sales, uh, profits per product or SKU wise. So give them some 50, give, tell them Hindustan Unilevers has 50 SKUs. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now these 50 SKUs have this much sales, this area, let them do the calculations at least they will be able to at least arrive at a certain situation. And again, when you look at a subject like finance, uh, finance is more about accuracy. So when you say exactly. the students reach the same result, your purpose <laughs> is to reach the same result, which is very different from a, what a marketing class will do. A marketing teacher never tells the students, this is right and this is wrong. A marketing teacher always tells them, if you do this, this is the consequence. If you do this, this is the consequence. But a finance teacher will always tell them, this is right and this is wrong. So if the students are actually reaching one conclusion, I feel you are doing your job very well. But then again, the only choice that, according to, as I've learned from you also right now, the only choice that we land up with is doing a comparative analysis, be it a balance sheet, be it the ratio. So, I mean, do we have a limited scope in that case? In More of a comparative than... Yeah. Yes, definitely, there, there is a limited scope. Especially when you're talking about financial accounting or financial management. When you go to more, uh, you know, uh, diverse areas like portfolio management, like mm. taxation. Uh, when you go to uh, subjects like financial law, probably you'll have more case studies which you'll be able to utilize. But in financial accounting and financial management, yes, there is... a. Uh, there is, you know, that's the reason why most faculties use more of uh, numericals or practical examples rather than using uh, case studies. But what you can actually and also do is you can enhance the practicals and create them as small caselets. So instead of giving them data as it is, hmm. give them a small caselet, let them derive the data. So why do you have to give them data on um, what is the fixed cost? What is the variable cost? What is this cost or what is that cost? Give them a caselet. Let them um, derive right. the data. They will right, find it right. interesting. Right. right. That would be much interesting. Yeah. Correct. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. Right. Any questions more coming in? Not yet? Okay. So I go back to my presentation. Please stop me anywhere that you find you would like to discuss something upon. So um, now we move on to the structure of the teaching case and I probably might skip uh, some slides in between just to keep up the time. Um, whenever you write the case study, something essentially required is write the case study in third person. Write it in past tense, right? Why you should do that. Whenever you write the case study, except dialogue case studies. And again, dialogue case studies are just a representation of the dialogue. Why you don't write it as a first person or a second person is that you don't want your personal bias to come in, right? So there are some certain case studies which I'll talk about called armchair case studies. But again, those case studies also, when we write the case studies, we recommend write them in third person. Never write them in the first person because that is something that might create bias. And that's what we do not want. So don't write the case studies in first person. 
Objectivity is something that can be maintained only if you write as past tense and um, as third person. Now, why am I saying past tense? And then you say, okay, you're talking about a current situation. So why I talk about the past tense is because I'm actually moving the person from what has happened earlier to what the current situation is. You can leave the reader at the present time and say, this is what. So I'm trying to kind of put the past, the present and the future. So when I write the story, I write it as past tense. And then when I conclude the story, I write it as present tense. And then I say, okay, this is the past, this is the present, and now you predict the future. And again, this is a good idea when you have series of cases, right? So you can actually create cases into series one, two, three, four, and then you say, okay, this was the past. This is what is the situation. What will you do? And then you have the next case wherein you said, okay, this is what the person did. And this is the current situation. Next, what will you do? So on and so forth. Um, begin the case with the hook. Okay. So what I mean by hook is whenever you start writing the case, you should know the issue that you will be emphasizing. Why is it essential for the writer is because when you collect information. I'm sure if you have been doing some case writing, you must be collecting ample amount of information. It becomes extremely difficult to segregate or drop information. So when you drop information, it is completely based upon the hook that you want to be creating. So any information or any data, which is somewhere or the other related to the issue that you want to be highlighting in that case study is something that you should keep and the rest is what you should delete. Another reason why you should have the overriding issue or the hook is whenever you send the case for publication, as I said, teaching note is something very, very essentially required by publications today. When you are preparing a teaching note, one of the topics that you have to essentially write in the teaching note is the area or the topic which the case is focusing on. So when you begin, you begin with the hook. And of course, that actually is your ultimate objective, which you want to be discussing. Uh, there is some amount of ambiguity that you should maintain in the case. It's a good way when you create a plot and you say this is theory, this is the concept or this is the methodology. But it should be ambiguous to an extent that you give the reader a possibility of exploration you give the reader some scope for imagination. Why is it essentially required is your student will have no interest or your reader will have no interest in your case study till they are able to imagine or explore something else. If everything is given in your case study as it is flat, what scope are you leaving for the reader to explore? And there is no way, um, I'm sure, you know, all of us watch movies and we find those movies interesting where after every scene you are thinking, what's going to happen next? Or if I was in this situation, what would I have done? Is he doing right or is he doing wrong? These are all situations which are ambiguous. Why is it that not everything is explicitly shown or spoken of? This is exactly what is required in multiple folds in a case study. So if you really want to create a good, write a good, interesting case study, leave some scope for ambiguity. Do not be very explicit. That does not mean you don't write clearly. Writing clearly is the basic of writing any um, academic um, you know, paper or any academic activity. But then situation should be left to be ambiguous and not very explicit, leaving possibility of imagination, creation and exploration for the reader. Uh, the situation should be such which um, tickle critical thinking. So there should be a debatable situation. If you give a situation which is absolutely straight, uh, there's nothing much to think about. There's nothing much to debate about. There's nothing much where I am the person who will finally drive the case forward from the place where you leave. So as an author, you leave the case at a, at a point where the reader has to pick it up and take the case forward. The reader will find it interesting only if the situation is debatable in nature. So create a situation which is debatable in nature and you know, um, you'll be able to create a good uh, kind of uh, uh, case study. 
most of the time, most of the times, um, how uh, you can you know begin your cases. So some common ways in which you open your case is one, you can begin with the protagonist, with the person around whom um, you are building up a case. So that is where you have a single person and the other actors in the case are just, you know, kind of uh, consequential in nature. Um, they are not necessarily important or essential actors. Sometimes when there is a group of people, so probably um, the country head, the finance uh, manager and the marketing manager are sitting together and thinking whether we should move away from this country or should we go ahead and spend some more amount of money in this country? Uh, for example, very recently you must have read that Metro is uh, exiting India or Ford's exited India. So now when we were uh, looking at this case study related to Ford, we were kind of looking at a set of people. So the people who are at the headquarters, the people who's the person who's heading the country uh, operations, the person who's involved in international marketing, all these people are sitting together. So these are the key decision makers. So you can either open with the protagonist or you can open with the decision makers. This is when you have people focused cases. The other is where you could begin from the problem or the issue, right? So you say, okay, um, um, suddenly we realize that the sales are coming down. Uh, the people who were constantly coming to us again and again for servicing their systems are somehow vanishing um, the kind of the, the 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 quantum of electrical waste is increasing people have started looking at um, um, uh, uh, accessories or auxiliaries uh, related to um, computers or related to laptops as something which is a one time use one and so forth so you're talking about a problem right that could be the beginning of the case uh, then you could also talk about timing. So for example, there were days when this is this was happening and this is not what is happening. Or you can just say that, you know, um, um, the World Bank has predicted that in 2023, all countries will be moving into uh, an economic crisis. Uh, so at this point of time, what's going to happen to countries like Pakistan, Sri Lanka, India, where do they stand what's going to happen to china so you're talking about the timing right the other possibility which is something that's not very popularly used but some cases may also begin with the indicative cause of the problem for example you say this guy has been involved into bribing people in the government um and suddenly you realize that because he was doing it, you have been, the company has been back blacklisted under these, 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 these areas. So you know, probably was it because of the person? Was it because of the situation? Was it because of the pressure that the company placed on the person? Was it that there is somebody else who's involved, but this is the guy who's uh, come into the limelight? What is happening? So you are not, you are kind of indicating the cause of the problem, but not exactly emphasizing the cause of the problem. Why am I talking about this? What should you open with? So when you write a case study, try that whatever you open with, your last paragraph should close with the same context. So if you're opening with the protagonist, as we just talked about um, Mia Foster, so we, the case study started with Mia Foster and ended with Mia Foster. So what you've done is you've created a loop. So the reader is able to figure out the, you know, the case study started from a protagonist and is ending at a protagonist. Similarly, you begin from the time, talk about what has happened earlier, 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 later, 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 and then again, come back to the same time which you started or you begin with the problem, come back to the same problem, and then move on the case case study with sometimes leading questions or sometimes open-ended case studies. So case studies can be written as um, case studies which are open-ended, which are the most popular in terms of publication. And you could also suggest leading questions. When you write case lets or when you write case studies only for your class usage, most of the time teachers prefer to use um, you know, uh, anchor points or anchor questions. But in open-ended case studies, teaching note is something where you'll essentially have to write questions, 
so that uh, you are able to suggest to the teacher what are the questions that you know you should start interrogating the students on um, so um, when you open you close at usually the same place otherwise the track of your case um, goes haywire you start somewhere and you end somewhere that doesn't uh, make sense so close with a close situation uh, with reference to what you open with the body should be a detailed story so you talk the story about so it's like a funnel how do you write it so for example um uh, if i'm writing a case study on x person who's involved with a y company and is into a situation for example they're trying to figure out what should be their hr policy because there is too much of attrition which is happening um all my sales people are completely gone i don't know what to do today because uh, it's my season time and uh, i have nobody to uh, make my pitch presentations right so ideally you would talk about what is the industry that the person is belonging to right so give some reference of the industry there is a possibility why do we give this reference there is a possibility that the similar kind of trend may be happening in the industry also then you talk about the background of the company what is the company being doing earlier does it have faulty hr policies because of which today it's uh, influencing or heavily uh, showing on the uh, marketing front um, you know what has happened uh, um, uh, earlier on in terms of uh, the suits that have been filed lawsuits that have been filed uh, by employees on the company or company filing lawsuits against the employees so you talk about the company you talk about what has happened in the company then you come down and talk about who are the leaders uh, what are the leadership positions um, how is those leadership position positions related to each other is it that um, you know sometimes the recruitments are extremely biased um, because the recruitments are biased that's the reason why uh, the people who are getting into the system are may not be apt may not be up to the point and they are using this only as a stepping stone this company is only as a stepping stone so what has conspired uh, in terms of the leadership in terms of the processes and then you come back and say okay this guy is in this situation and now he wants to understand what to do so it's a it's, a, it's something which is called a funnel approach i'm building a story but even while building a story i'm kind of moving from macro uh, attributes to more of mac micro attributes uh, i am trying to consider all environmental variables i am trying to consider all variables which are related to the organization ideally uh, uh, the story should show the one side of the story it should be you know built upon one side reason you let the other side of the story to be built up by the reader sometimes you show two sides of the story so if you have multiple uh, decision makers you could probably be showing two sides of the story but then you leave the imagination of the reader in terms that this person overtakes the other person what's going to happen and vice versa so there is some scope that you should lead for um, uh, the person to be able to imagine and the case should finally end while touching on crucial issues to resolve so which means that whatever issue you started with in the beginning you leave with that even when you have case studies which are written with keeping the protagonist in the center you will have to look at the issue that the protagonist is facing at this point of time and then you finally say okay this was the issue for example the, the mia foster case it started with this wherein she is going to china to understand what is the problem that's happening in china and then you end with this that now she has to make a decision whether she wants to replace the guy who's taking care of china operations she wants to close the china operations um uh, you know she wants to continue with this guy because he's built up the whole uh, china operations so you actually kind of ended there so even with the protagonist case you end up by uh again talking about the protagonist and the issue that the students should be brooding on why because whenever you have open ended cases you have to give some direction to the students so when we talk about these issues in the beginning and the end i'm sure when you were being taught how to analyze the case these are couple of things that uh, are told while analyzing the case look at the title that will give you an idea about what the case is about look at the first paragraph and the last paragraph so when you write the case study the first paragraph and the last paragraph should 
talk about the issues that you want to highlight in the case study and your body should provide information. And how do you provide information? You use the funnel uh, approach to uh, providing the information. So your case must definitely have a business issue, essentially, which you should be able to derive. Why? Because you have to write this in uh, your uh, teaching note. Second, sufficient amount of information to be able to create conclusions. So don't leave any information which is essentially required for conclusions. Yes, there are some places where you can leave scope for um, assumptions for the students. So when we tell them to analyze the case, we tell them if there are some assumptions that you are taking, for example, there is no mention of what is the current agency or the media, uh, uh, media contribution to the agency. Uh, there's no mention. So what the students can actually do is they can look at what is the industry trend at this point of time and use that as an assumption. Uh, this is okay, but otherwise uh, it makes no sense. Um, you know, if you are uh, uh, you know uh, looking at uh, uh, data or providing information which is not conclusive in nature, uh, reduce any extra information that you have, and make the case interesting in terms of your text so that it assures that a person who's reached reading twenty pages does not get lost. So what should the reader be able to do when they're reading uh, your case study? Uh, they should be able to conclude from the information. They should be able to segregate that this text is irrelevant or low value, does not contribute directly or there's only indirect. But this information is something that is essentially important. So when you teach your students to analyze the case, what do you tell them? Important information, highlight it. Mark it so that you can come and read it again. What are they trying to do? They are segregating between irrelevant and relevant information. For example, when I said you are creating a funnel of information, that funnel of information so many times is created. For example, I don't need information about competitors essentially to solve a case on my accounting principles, right? But that's mentioned there just as a way to suggest that these are the um, you know, current norms of the industry. Or you give them some basics about the industry, statistics about the industry, which they may not be requiring. Or you are telling them, 1980, this company was established, and this is this who were the people, and this one, and so forth. So that information is something that may not be essentially required for making decisions. Students should be able to uh, segregate uh, that kind of information. Excuse me. Use um, real-time data, use empirical data, but again and again, I tell you this, do not give data which is cooked data. Give them data which is raw data. Let them interpret the data, but um, do not give them insufficient data for decision-making. Originality is something that you should always maintain, especially um, when you are uh, trying to you know, publish your case studies. Uh, uh, case studies are also method for research paper writing. I'm sure you must be knowing about this, that today's trending way of research paper writing is using your own case studies and writing research papers, uh, using case study methods, okay? So um, that's another reason why your case study should be such, which could be um, uh, created or developed into a research paper. A good way is write multiple case studies on the same concept and then create a research paper where you're using your own case studies uh, which have been uh, created on your um, you know kind of concept um, try and look for um, concepts which are novel or new and uh, also when you are writing a case study look through whatever case studies have been published earlier on on the same topics that helps you um, you know um, that actually you know helps you understand whether it's going to be published or not case studies which have been written Constantly on the same topic is not something that the publications are ready to publish, um, you know, again and again. So, um, uh, you know, um, case studies uh, which are novel is uh, uh, something which is, uh, you know, in right now. What a case should not do. So, uh, confused objectives. You have to be very, very clear about why you are writing your case study. Even if you do not mention that anywhere in your case study, you should have a very clear clarity because when you are sending your case study for publication, you are mentioning 
which is the topic, subtopic, area, or learning objective that you want to derive of your case study. If you go to Harvard, you go to Emerald, everywhere when you look at filtering of the case studies, they are based on objectives. What you are looking for in the case study, right? Never have an objective which is confused. Uh, never include both the challenge as well as the solution. There is no scope for uh, results, right? Uh, nothing that contains a single customer quote, okay? So uh, let's understand this. This is specifically applicable to marketing case studies, wherein uh, if you are using only a single customer quote, even when it's an institutional customer, a big customer for you, yet a single customer is not able to echo the voices of your complete uh, customer base. So never contain a single customer quote. If you are using customer quotes, use at least multiple customer quotes. Do not base yourself on a single customer uh, quote. And, uh, you know, um, case studies uh, should not be written so um, so systematically uh, or so without story that they become um, um, boring okay um so this is something that i would have definitely wanted to ask you but then i'll not spend time on that uh, so our case study uh it's an art to write the science of case studies okay so case study is a science but there is an art in writing the case study um it is neither a fiction so it's not just a story without facts um, nor is it investigative journalism. So a lot of people, um, you know, when you say, I'm going to compile information from secondary data, or I'm going to pick up data and write. So that's investigative journalism. Until unless you're able to build a story upon the news articles that you've picked up, a case is not built. So when you're building a case, it's an art in building the case, but the contents are more of a science. Um, so quickly, this question, um, this is also on the Mentimeter um, in case if we have time. So we do have time. Um, can we go back to the Mentimeter and um, attempt this question? Yes, ma'am. So I hope you are able to see this. Yes, ma'am. Participants, you have to click on the same link which has been shared by a ma'am. Uh, should I uh, re-share uh, the link? No, no ma'am, I think working. that is there in chat. It's working and it's refreshed now. Uh, ma'am, can you please share the link, the link again? Uh, link is not visible in the chat box. Yes, ma'am, please share it again. the link and the code. Okay, uh, 
So I think uh, uh, most people have said one to five pages. Uh, there's another bulk which says five to 10 pages. Two people say half to one page, that's a caselet, and 10 to 25 pages, uh, one person is saying. So I'll quickly interpret this for you. Um, let's understand what is the objective of your case writing. If you're looking at publications, um, you look at IV cases, Richard IV cases, you look at Harvard cases, you look at Emerald cases, all of them are lengthy cases. They are exhaustive in nature. So if publication is your objective, you'll have to go for longer cases. Um, if you are looking only from the perspective of um, you know, short cases for the students who are at bachelor's level, probably a one to five page case uh, will do. Uh, for a master's, a five to 10 will do. But if you are looking at case studies and your primary pedagogy um, of your course is case study, you definitely have to be going in for longer case studies. Um, so what I will do is I'll straight away go back to my presentation and talk about this. Okay, so um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, 1920 was the time when actually case writing or case studies became extremely popular. That was the time when a um, you know, lot of cases would uh, be very long, right? And now, uh, now is the current time that we are talking about. Case studies, length of case studies have reduced considerably. It has come down from 28 pages to 14 pages. And 77% of the best-selling cases, this is the data from Case Center, 77% of their best-selling cases are not more than 20 pages. Sometimes we love to write exhaustive cases, but if you're looking at publication, uh, try and keep maintain your average length, including your appendices and your exhibits to be on an average of 14 pages, right? Uh, Whenever you do your case writing, uh, this GIGO principle goes absolutely aptly in case writing. Um, if you put in a lot of information, if you just keep uh, you know, quoting information and information from secondary sources, there is a fair possibility your students will never be able to reach the right decisions. So content uh, or how you are writing, your creative thinking, your planning and your organization of the case is something that will decide whether your case goes in for publication and goes in for a good uh, class analysis or not okay um, cases uh, you can write um, so there are when we write the case studies we generally classify them into field research cases which is the most popular and um, most effective if you're looking at uh, um, at uh, publication. The other is desk research and the least popular is armchair uh, cases written a uh, very few number of times. So field research cases, 50% of the cases that you will be able to see as publications are cases which are field research cases. Um, they are the cases which are relevant because they actually capture the nuances of business. And uh, these cases are also good because when you convert um, a research case. So what's a field research case is a case study when you are collecting data from the company or from the people themselves and then converting it to um, you know, the story or the case study. Sometimes um, a nod or an opinion or mm -mm, yes, yes, no, no, is something that you're trying to create in the form of a story. So you said uh, this person aggressively talked about this or this person uh, ignored this point. So what you're trying to do is you are trying to convert the body language or the opinion or the innotations of the person that you've met into um, the story. So all this is extremely good and effective, works very well in case of uh, um, you know, publication. Uh, the challenge with these kind of cases is that um, you know, sometimes you build a story which may sound a little unreal or different from uh, what actually has happened. So this is important uh, because a lot of you will be involved into field research. I thought, let me put across the points that are important or what do you do? How do you go about it? So the first thing is uh, try and um, you know, identify focus of the case study within the specific organization. So how do you do that? When you approach an organization to collect data from that person, 
most of the time the organization will ask you this question who do you want to meet okay who do you want to meet is and the answer to this also creates focus of your case study so if i am interested in meeting um people from the production department i want to meet some people who are working on the shop floor and maybe a foreman or two my focus area is to understand what are the production issues that the people are having or i want to meet somebody from the purchase department i want to meet somebody uh, who is also involved in r and d and marketing probably i am trying to create a case related to supply chain okay or i'm trying to create a, a a case related to alternative raw materials of the you know scope of alternative raw materials so uh, your understanding or your focus of the case study will help you answer these kind of questions if you go absolutely unprepared to an organization and say i want to come and meet you to do a case study who will you meet what will you ask them may do you have a questionnaire with you do you have a data sheet which you want them to answer for you all this kind of information is something that you will be able to gather only if you know what is your focus area two whenever you approach a company or an organization you should be ready with information that is already available so i don't go to a person and ask them can you give me the address to your website or does your website contain this 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 i have already done a study on whatever data is available on uh, secondary sources so maybe their corporate websites their brochures um their um you know uh, financial reports their annual reports um you know or their general meeting uh, agendas and all that that's already available yes if there is a news article that is coming i'm not sure whether this news article is true or not i can use that as a reference and ask them questions related to the news article but i'm not asking them information on whatever is already available so i'm not going to ask them what are the products that you make i should be aware about what are the products that i make what they are making i may ask them questions related to what is your next uh, product range that you are going to be launching or what is your next product launch dates okay that is something that i may ask i can ask them questions related to um what are the kind of r and d areas that you are investing more money into that will get give me an idea about what are the future products that uh, you know they could probably be launching but i'm not going to ask them what is their existing product range you have to be extremely clear and you will be able to collect this data only when you are sure about what is the key focus of your case study and be precise don't say just marketing in marketing what are you looking at in hr what are you looking at are you looking at recruitment are you looking at training are you looking at uh, issues related to um, uh, labor unions are you looking at application of uh, uh, you know are they actually uh, investing money in uh, employee development or um, uh, are they actually investing money in social causes um, you know what is the relevance how do they do that you have to be very very clear then look at opportunities with potential contributors so again as i said uh, i don't know who the person is but i at least know who's the designation who do i want to be meeting who do i want to be interacting right um, initial contact of the organization should be a person who is responsible for releasing the formal release authorization letter as i mentioned whenever you want to publish a case you will have to um, you will require to get your authorization release uh, formal letter to be signed by that person okay so whosoever is working as the liaison should be the person try and agree on the parameters of case research so you can tell them i'm going to be requiring to meet person in this area this area this area and if they permit go ahead if they don't permit you probably have to um you know kind of modify um your area um i'm sorry if somebody could quickly tell me whether i am audible and my presentation is visible because i get a note which says that my internet connection is a little unstable yes ma'am you are audible and uh, even visible you are audible. thank you so much thank you so much um then uh, you know probably um, some kind of a uh, um, undertaking could be signed in the initial stages which works as 
um, you know, um, a kind of a document for you. So I have seen people get into situations like this, that initially when I started writing the case study, the company said, okay, we'll let you write, use the company name and everything. But um, the authorization letter will be signed only once I submit them the final draft of the case study, right? But when this the draft was submitted, the officials refused, right? So what you should do in that case is when you are going initially, the initial document, for example, that's a simple letter which says that, um, you know, this, this, this person is permitted to collect data and write a case study using the name of the uh, company and all these kind of things. Um, yes, of course, once the final draft is uh, authorized by the company, in that case, you are safeguarded. So make sure that if you're going for this kind of a study, get some initial letter, which you can use at a later stage. Uh, desk research, I've already spoken to you about. Um, once you write the first draft and compile your supporting material, try and send it across to the company uh, for verification. In case if you've got some data or some facts wrong, if they want to change something, if they want to include or um, exclude uh, certain things. And then, of course, finally, we get the formal release authorization from the organization. Um, these days, multimedia cases is something which is extremely popular. So you could either add a video uh, for multimedia content, or you could also create a multimedia uh, case study. Um, right now in India, multimedia case studies are not very popular. Some institutions are definitely using it. So I would recommend at this point of time, you could, you know, add on um, a video to add to your uh, case study, okay? Then there's desk research where, um, again, uh, you know, something which you normally would do, um, collect information from secondary sources, put it together, create a story about it. But then uh, the challenges or what you should be careful about is never use sources for desk research which are not authentic. So using a Wikipedia, or using a newspaper is not something which is authentic, right? Don't use newspapers, use reports. So maybe a UNESCO report or a World Bank report or a WTO report, you know, these kind of reports or documents which have been issued by government officials or government itself. These are documents which people will rely on. And even if you are sending a case like this for publication in ETK studies, um, you know, you will be able to get more value and your case study will be published faster. In fact, not just this, um, there is a possibility when you run this kind of a case study in the classroom, your students may ask you, what is the authenticity of maybe a Hitwada or maybe a, a free press, uh, you know, what is the authenticity? They may be charging money and writing this kind of a stuff. Why do you quote this, right? So whenever you are using references or whenever you are using, um, you know, sources for information, ensure that these sources are authentic and uh, you have a full trust on uh, the source of this data. Uh, and uh, when you write references to this kind of a source, always mention these references with dates. So you actually looked up this data at this, this, this date. So later on, if there is a change in the information given on a particular website or given on a particular, um, you know, uh, by a particular company, um, you know, you can always say that this uh, data or information was assessed on this particular date. Then there are armchair cases. Uh, sorry, yeah. sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Uh, is there any need to give references in field researches also? If in case you are using data from uh, a particular source, for example, um, you know, you could always give reference of the website of the company that you used, or if there is a, a sectoral uh, study that has been done. So IBEF has done a sectoral but, study, right? But if and you are, are taking, quoting those sectoral. Okay. But if we are yes. taking interviews of a person, we are meeting in personal, then how will... Then they uh, then uh, is there any need to give no. any authenticity for that or any no. The only authenticity that you are giving is your draft has been uh, approved by the company and they have given you permission to use the name of the company. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. That is the authentication. Thank you so right. much. Uh, these case studies are 
case studies which are written on personal experiences. So people who have worked in a particular area for a certain point of time may decide to write their own experiences um, or their uh, point of views about a particular aspect. Um, not very popular when it comes to publication, less credible, sometimes could be fictitious in nature. Okay. Uh, so I'll uh, leave this point uh, as of now, since we are running short of time. And, um, you know, I'll move on to this, wherein, uh, you know, I want you to question yourself before you begin writing the case study. Is the case fit for the topic that I want to be covering? Now, why this case fitment is required is because when you write your teaching note, you probably have to mention that these are the topics under which your case study can be utilized. Until unless you are ready to give this target audience definition, your case study neither will be published nor will it be utilized. Even if you are able to publish it, people will not use your case study, right? Just because your case study does not fit in particular topics. As teachers, what do we do? We look for this, okay, I want a case study on this topic, this module, okay? If your case study is not fitting into a particular module or related modules, so I don't say necessarily one module, but three modules, your case study will not find readers and users. Okay. Then audiences. So how do I define audiences? Is it an undergraduate class or is it a postgraduate class? Reason. An undergraduate class may be uh, able to understand only level one, level two of the topic. It's the master students who can understand a three or a four. So if you're writing a case study for a bachelor's class versus the master's class, it's going to be quite different. The master's students are more mature. They're more experienced. Um, they are, uh, you know, they have the capability of deep diving into the topic. And that's the reason why they will be able to analyze your case study better as compared to the bachelor student. So what do I do? I strip down the case study, right? And create it for the bachelor students, wherein I just talk about the basics, right? And I do not talk to them about complex articulations. If I'm creating complex articulations, my audiences have to be necessarily uh, the senior students, or maybe students who are in their final year of uh, the bachelor's course. So they have been, um, you know, exposed to different areas and they have an understanding. So you can always identify your target audiences and then create your case study according to this or define your audiences based upon what you're talking about. Always look for existing case studies. So if there are case studies which are already published in your area, it's waste to um, you know, spend your time on that topic. Look at newness of the topic or if the topic has undergone a drastic change, it's a good idea um, to you know, publish uh, your case study in that area. Um, where will you classify your case? Because your I'm, I'm not saying you have to explain to somebody else why the type of case. It is up to you because when you are able to classify your case, you know your direction. You know your route. Okay. Um, you know, um, so it's like, you know, using the Google Maps to reach the same destination, different routes. So I may be reaching the same destination, but I'm using a different route because my type of case study differs. What will be the decision focus? I, am I able to create things like controversy, contrast, conflict, or dilemma in the case? Which means that I said, you don't create confusion, but you create a possibility of discussion, a possibility of exploration. So create some amount of controversy or contrast to people thinking two absolutely different things. Or you can say, um, the company... If it goes this way, this is going to happen. And if it goes this way, this is going to happen. If I drop my products um, or I withdraw from the country, I don't know how the other countries are going to respond. Or if I'm entering a new country, how it's going to respond. And if I stay in the country, what is going to be the impact on the losses that I'm incurring in my headquarters? So I'm creating a contrast. I'm creating two situations which are completely opposite to each other. Uh, then, of course, uh, you know, uh, begin with the standard components, look at the time frame, the data that you will be requiring, and uh, the style that you would like to be um, using, right? 
So when you write narrative cases, um, you know, I'll quickly uh, go through this. Um, you begin or talk about um, um, a story or a scenario. You start adding data to that scenario, start adding complexity to the situation. And probably with adding actors, you create a drama. You could also use conversation, but your main thing should be the plain thing. So do not highlight your main thing. Let the readers highlight your main thing, right? Um, so it should be as plain as possible. Um, this is something that I've spoken about. Uh, so, uh, the you know, the only thing that I will quickly add on is that now remember to segregate your cases into headings, sections, right? Understand where should be the location of diagrams or data, number of diagrams that you should be having. They should neither be too many that become unnecessary and nor too less. So there's also something like this. We always, um, you know, kind of figure this out. Should I write this data in paragraph or should I convert this into a table, right? And as I said, a good idea could be put some information in the paragraph and the rest of the information in the table for letting the students have an opportunity to go back to the text, look for the missing data, retrieve it from there and then put it in their analysis. So um, uh, create a chronological order, write in past tense, use actual dates as much as possible, um, create a sequence uh, in your case. So when you are creating an expository structure, the idea is the data should be relevant in terms of the outcomes that uh, you want to derive uh, out of the data uh, never give results as it is. Let there be some analysis that's going to happen. The plot structure should be such that the key characters of the organization or the key decision makers are exposed and the learners are able to step into the shoes of the character. Um, you can also decide the pace of the case. So what, what do I mean by the pace of the case? Like the Amazon case that you saw, started in 1997, goes on till the current date, okay? So the pace of the case is very fast. You've covered so many decades in a single case, there could be a possibility where you start the pace of the case just as, you know, just when the pandemic happened, this is the situation and then you come down to the current date. So you can set the pace of the case depending upon what you would like to be, um, you know, looking at. Um, so I'll instead of this talk about this. So uh, the, a case structure, an ideal case structure should have a case heading. A case heading should be more than uh, the name of the company, okay? So for example, um, uh, uh, the branding dilemma, a case study of XYZ company or XYZ company into a branding dilemma, okay? So I have already with the case heading said that this case is about this company and it's about the branding dilemma, okay? So some hint about the topic of the case study or, um, you know, frame your, um, you know, title in a format where, you are able to indicate what the case reader has to be, um, you know, essentially searching for in the case study. Uh, the first paragraph should be related to the key issues. Then you start moving to the context. And I said, use the funnel way of doing it. Come down to the current situation. You could also be looking at uh, the history of organization or the key characteristics. Finally, end with, again, a reminder or a paragraph about the key issues, include exhibits, and then go on to the teaching note. So um, I will skip this and straight away go to, yeah, the key teaching note, which is the most essential document. And um, as I said, it's, uh, it's always useful for the academicians as well as for publications. So you should definitely write a teaching note. And what should be the components of the teaching note? Uh, the teaching note should contain, should begin with the summary of the case study. Then you should be able to say, what are the teaching objectives? And when I say teaching objectives, they should be similar to the learning objectives, which I used before writing, decided on type of the case study, right? Who will be my target audience? Will it be bachelors, uh, masters? Uh, which subjects will I be covering? Which modules or which topics will I be covering? What kind of teaching approach is required? So should you begin from a debate? Should you begin from the decision 
go back to the analysis should you begin from understanding the data um, you know crunching the data and then coming down to the decision making what should be the teaching approach approach you can also give um, you know um, a blackboard uh, format wherein you say okay your blackboard should be divided into xyz topics so one place you should be doing the industry analysis you should be doing the company analysis and then you should be doing um, understanding of revenues or profits so on and so forth um, analysis questions. Um, uh, so the analysis should have header questions or what we call anchor questions, wherein you are trying to lead the teacher, um, uh, lead the class. Uh, uh, you assist the teacher to lead the class and you tell them you can ask a question like this, 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 and then come to the conclusion. Uh, there are times when I don't want to include secondary data in the case study itself. So I can offer it as additional resources in the teaching note, uh, especially uh, in cases when you want short cases to be produced. And finally, you can give a feedback in the teaching note. So feedback is how should the teacher debrief the case study? So a teacher is also when you do the case analysis in the class, you are required to debrief. Debriefing is when you tell the students what is it that they should derive or what is their takeaway from this session of the case study analysis, that is the feedback that you should provide to your um, teachers. Okay. Um, sometimes when there are sequential cases, you could also let this teacher know what happened next so that the teacher can summarize and end at a note on what happened next in the case study. Uh, with this, I thank you. And, um, and I'm absolutely open for questions, though I know I have cut short some of my slides. Uh, 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 any questions that you will have, I'm open to that. Ma'am would like to ask one question. Yes, please. Uh, as uh, you mentioned that uh, you have worked in various applied science university in foreign countries, right? So what is the methodology which has been adopted by those universities like in India or in Devi Ajaya University, we are having five units of a particular subject and uh, in each unit we used to teach one case study related to the topics. So what is the methodology which has been adopted by foreign universities? Okay, sir. Uh, so I will tell you, basically, um, since I'm more connected to European uh, universities, uh, they, there are two types of universities which exist there. One is um, um, an applied science university, and other is the academic or research-based university. So how do students actually choose these universities? Somebody who wants to go for higher education, right? Um, more of research, they will go into regular universities. But students who are more interested in going in for hands-on or working along with studying, they will go for applied sciences universities. The curriculum of the applied sciences university contains everything that is more experiential in nature. So time spent on lecturing, for example, I do a 90 minute session uh, with the students. I spend only 30 to 40 minutes explaining the concept. And after that, I have activities. I have case studies for each of my topics. It, it could be caselets. Um, it could be activities where the students are actually um, investing more time and exploring on the particular concept. So when I divide my time related to the session time, uh, it's like, you know, more of time is given to student activities wherein they apply the concepts. I, you know, my role as a teacher is to be able to create activities which let the students explore information and then, of course, offer them concluding remarks. So there's a lot of information that the students get, but sometimes it may be irrelevant. The sources that they're using is not right. They're not going the right direction. So I should be able to um, give them a direction. So um, case studies or application-based activities, uh, for example, we do something like a world cafe. Uh, we do, um, uh, you know, group uh, research-based activities. Um, uh, when I'm doing online sessions, I use a lot and lot of, uh, um, you know, um, uh, uh, separate activities wherein the students are uh, interacting with each other. 
For example, I let two students work on the same topic and then they, um, you know, kind of um, create um, a room and uh, discuss with each other and come on to conclusions with this. So this, uh, so in Applied Sciences University, Peer-to-peer -peer learning is something which is very, very important and given a lot of importance. Uh, so we, I just don't use case studies, but I use other methods also where the students are participating and I work as an anchor, which also makes my job tough because I have to prepare each and every topic and look at all the possible routes that the student is, uh, you know, possibly might be taking because at that point of time, I don't have time to research. So I have to do a lot of homework before I create an activity for the students. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, participants, if you are having any doubt, so now the forum is open for the discussion. Uh, can I ask a question, ma'am? Please. Uh, ma'am, as you're working uh, both in the industry as well as academics, and you know, cases are normally, uh, you know, depends on the practical concepts only. But in academics, we actually teach the students the theoretical part. So in which uh, sector cases are more, you know, practical and more able to understand the concepts related to the cases and the characters of the cases? In which industry? In the industries or in the academics? Uh, 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 I would put it like this, that uh, case studies find equal relevance in the um, industry as well as academia. But the purpose is different. Uh, in academics, case studies are meant for students or the participants to analyze and come to decisions. Whereas in corporate, case studies are largely written um, as case examples of best practices for customers, um, sometimes employees also. Uh, so I have also worked with a company which was um, which was in ITES. Um, that time I was an academician, but I got an assignment where I was writing case studies for them for internal circulation. So for example, they would give me a situation, I will write a case study, and they would circulate that as an internal communication uh, to their employees, telling them uh, that this was a situation, this is how it was handled. If you enter into a similar situation, this is the possibility that you can do. So again, uh, case studies in corporate are very relevant to exhibit best practices um, as inter for internal employees as well as for customers. But then um, the purpose for case studies differs both in corporate and academia. Um, both places, they play a very crucial role. Um, the only thing is the way you write the case study differs when you do it for a corporate versus when you do it for a classroom. Thank you, thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Baby, see the battle. Yes, anyone else want to ask something? Hello, ma'am. Hello, sir. Yes. Suppose I'm, I'm writing a case visit about the finance and accounting because i'm from the finance domain so which procedure are most preferable for writing the case study finance and accounting i think more uh, data loaded cases will be uh, having more relevance there because you're ultimately wanting uh, the student to get into the habit of uh, data crunching so i think but more data to be based on our secondary data so how is to be right now because the cook data is not required for the emerald and publication. So how to write that? No, sir, data is definitely required for emerald and uh, ETK studies or the case center. Uh, the only problem is that you, if in case you are using data, you have to get uh, some, um, you know, kind of acknowledgement from the companies whose data you are using or uh, an authentic secondary source that you are using the data for. Now, in your case, what you can actually do is you can create hypothetical cases uh, or you can use more than one company. So when okay. you use secondary sources, a good way is instead of using a single company because the company might get offended, you can create a scenario and use examples of two, three companies and then use secondary sources with data and you can definitely get it published. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for your valuable uh, solution. I have a question. Uh, yes, what would be the probable heading of case in case of people-oriented cases? Like, 
um, protagonist oriented somebody which is a protagonist yes, based case yes yes yeah so even when i have a case study which is protagonist based my focus is on the issue okay right so the case study instead of yes you can use the name of the protagonist for example i could have said mia fosters um deciding on market expansion or market expansion uh, mia fosters view so i could use the name of the protagonist but then definitely i need to use the um, issue also so don't forget this that even if uh, the case study is based on the protagonist the protagonist is handling a particular issue in that area hello ma'am Yes, uh, ma'am. Can uh, I? I came across with a case study that was based on real fruit, uh, real juice, and it was an ethical dilemma. It was lovely professional university case study. So, if I am framing a case study related to Swiggy or Amazon or some real life situation, and I am uh, creating a drama there, so can I put the name of the service provider, maybe Amazon, Swiggy, or something like that, or uh, it is unethical to use the name here? in the case study uh, as i said a good way or a safer way could be instead of using just the name of one company use multiple companies and use industry based uh, research data uh, in case of publications uh, some publications might ask you to make a declaration okay so just that declaration would be sufficient there is no problem but just to safeguard your interest i always recommend don't use a single company don't use controversial issues related to that single company instead you create a case study on swiggy zomato and all the other uh, food providers uh, all these apps uh, which are into um, and you know create more of an industry based case study where these are actual real players okay ma'am thank you um ma'am can i ask a small question please yes. uh ma'am ma i may sound oh shit shit <laughs> i think shriji ma'am just stuck in a problem so no problem sir maybe you can take her question and post it to me i will be happy to respond sure sure ma'am sure Ma'am, there is a question again popping in my mind. Uh, Ma'am, how to think? Uh, how to handle some controversial issue, which is the main central idea of the case, like some religious uh, based issues, or you know, to hurting some religious sentiments, or like bad recruitments happen, you know, uh, of a particular community, or anything like that. How to handle such issues in the case? the good way is give both sides of the picture so when you are talking about something like this you can always create characters and say this person thinks that this is religious but the recruiter thinks that these people are more you know that they are more apt for the job they have the requisite skills so give both sides of the picture that will uh, reduce the bias that you yourself as an author create in the case study all right ma'am thank let you. the readers analyze it let the readers analyze it you give both sides of the picture so when you are talking about something like this for example you say um they uh, you know recruited one one part of the society xyz okay and so you say there there is a bias there could be a bias because this guy is all from that community and is uh, recruiting people from the same community on the other side you say these guys who are recruited from the same community they have absolutely the right skills which are required for sales for marketing for whatever and uh, they qualify they meet all the qualification parameters uh, leave it at that leave it at that place actually Let the case talking about uh, finally this particular community because of recruiting so many people from the same community that ended up with, uh, with a strike which mm -hmm. has happened uh, in that particular situation okay so you can end it there and you can just leave it for the readers to say whether it the strike happened because of the community or because of the issues they not necessarily it could be because of the community so leave it there leave it leave it for the readers to analyze and give you the reasons so Let we can it, touch those areas i mean is it okay to touch those okay. areas but whenever you are writing you are writing the way you are writing is important as i said if i was in your place i will try to put both sides of the picture and let the readers decide what they want to look at it like 
All right, ma'am, thank you. Uh, good evening, ma'am. I have a question on Dr. Gagan. And uh, yes, first of all, it's always a pleasure to, uh, to attend your uh, case writing sessions. I have done it earlier in 2009 okay. uh, while I was a part of IPC Academy only, and then I moved to industry. So I have rejoined now. Uh, okay. Ma'am, I have one question. What if the company usually avoids or does not permit or approves the, uh, to publish the name, ma'am? Accounting data. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry. Accounting data, finance related data. They generally do no, not I, permit. Suppose I have collected certain data with the permission of the company only, but then the company does not want its name to be published in the uh, case. So mm -hmm. how can we go about it? You can just, um, um, you know, uh, create a hypothetical company and um, preferably uh, do not because there are some data of the company which is publicly available also. So use that data and you can but even you, uh, you know scale that data. So just multiply or divide it by a common denominator and you'll be able to get the same data using the same thing and then you can publish the data. Don't use the data as it is until unless the company has permitted you to use the data. So will it give authentic uh, authenticity to the case? Why not? Will the, because... See, even the publications understand this, that uh, for such kind of uh, critical data um, or sensitive data, the companies may not be able to give you the permission to use this. So what you can actually do is in the authorization statement that you get signed from the company, you can get it written that the name of the company has been changed, the name of the people has been changed, and the data has been altered uh, to suit uh, non-disclosure of the company, right? So you can get that letter or that format signed and submit it to the publication for, uh, you know, getting it published. There is no problem. It's not that you are getting only the declaration form signed that, yes, you can use the name of the company. You can always get it signed like this, wherein you say, uh, I have changed the name, I have altered the data, um, and I have changed the name of the people also. Um, and they will be ready to right. sign it and you can use it for publication. Ma'am, thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you. That's uh, it actually, uh, uh, this is my question now. Thank you. So, um, I've put my email ID in the chat box in case if there are any further questions you can address to me on my email ID and I'll be happy to answer. Yeah, so thank you. So much, ma'am. Um, within a short span of time, I think you have covered. Uh, huge number of topic like uh, importance of case analysis then the types of cases case characteristics then case writing uh, structuring so a number of things which you have covered is uh, tremendous and still people are asking the question that means this particular session is a huge success so on behalf of entire IPS Academy, IBMR, and AICT Atal Academy, I would like to thank you so much, ma'am, for sparing your valuable time and enlightening all the participants of this particular faculty development program. So thank you so much, ma'am. And one small request I would like to do on behalf of all the participants, if you could share one or two of your cases with yeah, uh, yeah. the participants, so they'll be going through that and they'll be having one insight regarding how to write cases in a particular flow. So that sure, would be great, ma'am. Sure, I'll share the links of my case studies since they're all published. You can have a look at that. And in fact, uh, um, you know, I was kind of skipping through so many of my slides just because I normally do this as an extended session. I still could not touch on publications. I would have loved to do a more detailed uh, analysis on uh, research-based cases. What are the challenges that people face? how they should uh, overcome those challenges. But it's good that uh, participants have been asking so many questions and I'm, I am happy to help you and I'll be happy to help you in future also. Yes, sure, ma'am, sure. You so much, so, thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much thank for you. the wonderful session. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night, good night, ma'am. Good night, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. There is one small announcement regarding uh, tomorrow's session. So tomorrow we'll be having the session on case-based approach in alignment with NEP 2020. And uh, I'll be sharing 
one case study which will be discussed by the speaker professor kitan gandhi sir uh, in the next session so till then take care thank you bye bye and happy learning thank you so much for joining this particular program thank you so uh, much. sir the case study will be shared over the mail or the whatsapp group in whatsapp and in mail also i'll be sharing that case study okay thank you sir okay thank you so much have a good day sir thank, thank you so good night yeah good night thank good you. night everyone yeah good night, good night.